Great to be here. Thank you everyone for joining us. Now we're going to zoom in on uh, one of the world's uh, most uh, emitting industries, the textile industries. And maybe more importantly, how can we change that? How can we make uh, this industry go from a climate villain to an uh, impact hero? Mm. And with me to discuss that, I have some of the, of the frontiers uh, in this industry. So Petri has been focusing on recycling cotton for about 10 years will share his experience, and Dennis, who's with us, uh, who's uh, working on a brand new way to recycle polyester. Uh, and they will share both their perspective on the industry and also how to build a company in impact. So super excited to hear. Let's dive in. And maybe the first question to you, Petri, given that you've been in this industry for, for about 10 years now, what have you seen in terms of change during these 10 years? We have um, actually witnessed quite a bit of, of, of changes, but I would be a bit more bolder and, and, and state that we have actually fueled quite a bit on, on the change by ourselves. Because when we started uh, and we were introducing our concept of, of making uh, a premium quality textile fiber out of, of the textile waste, was something which really didn't exist on the markets. Uh, and we understood right from the beginning that, that we really have to be working not only with the textile value chain, but the leading brands in order to get the trust, confidence around the solution so that, that that kind of solution can be existing. And uh, whilst, let's say, we were let's say, uh, from early on uh, capable of, of, of and, and successfully engaging many of, of the leading brands such as HSM and Inditex and so forth, I think say that was really giving the trust to the whole value chain that the, the solution is tree, true. Uh, and because of that work also, we were kind of, of um, as a pioneer, we were invited to participate on the regulation development. So uh, surprisingly early on, there was also a discussion by the EU about the new regulations. So we were happy to in in introduce, so uh, engage in, in that discussion. Uh, and then taking, taking one, another example of, of the changes, what we have witnessed is the uh, ultra fast fashion, which has been kind of, of lately coming into the stage. Uh, many see that that is a problem, but I would actually state that that's a an, very interesting catalyst mm. because as such that has uh, impacted on discussion and made the regulators, make the, the consumers to really evaluate that what is the ultra fast fashion, what's the impact and what's the culture we are creating. So uh, because of that, we, we've seen now lately that EU has been very actively putting in place new regulation. The, uh, extended producer responsibility, eco-design directive, which is, is kind of requesting after uh, circularity as well as durability at the same time. So that's been kind of very interesting to see that what has been on, on stage for a long time has been now coming true. And uh, also we see a, a kind of, of great, um, great interest from the industry itself to, to kind of, of change. And particularly on the circularity, as circularity is, is much sharper, uh, message rather than sustainability, which is very broad concept. Mm. Okay, so things are moving in, in the right direction at least. Very, very strongly. Very good too. And Dennis, you're, you're a bit uh, newer in this space yep. um, and you've chosen to focus on polyester. Maybe we can start with why polyester? Yep, I'll be happy to and uh, glad to be here. So uh, this is the forerunner in the industry and we're happy uh, to be the new kids on the block. Mm. So we launched in March. Uh, and the way we did that was very different because our founders is actually H&M, the uh, fashion brand, and Vargas is another company. And the way they approached this business is that they looked at the uh, uh, CO2 potentials uh, and they do that in different industries like steel and battery, etc. But it, when they approached textiles, then it was quite clear from a decarbonization perspective, you need to tackle the number one fiber in the world which then is polyester. So 57% of all the textile fibers in the world today is polyester. And that is being produced from oil. So around 70 million metric ton every year is being produced from oil when it comes to textile. And the reason for polyester is quite simple. It's a very useful fiber. It's a cost efficient and useful fiber. So you find it in airbags, in seat belts, in clothes, everywhere. And we need to make that circular, mm. and we need to make it quick. <laughs> yeah. So that's our hyperscaling approach, and that's also why we attack uh, polyester mm. as a start. Mm. And we're happy to bring on other fibers along the way. But starting with polyester is where you make the biggest mm. impact 
from our perspective. Mm. And I'm sure uh, I'm not the only consumer in this room who has kind of at some point bought a garment and it says recycled polyester, you feel really good about it and you go home and wear that with pride. But you're working on something completely new. Could you maybe yeah. share like, what's different with your technology and why shouldn't I be proud when I wear yeah. that old That's garment? Right. So that was also my thought when I looked into this industry and said, all right, recycled polyester, it seems to already exist, mm. uh, but it does not really. So when you see recycled polyester today, apart from a very small portion, then that is actually a PET bottles. So then you're taking bottles from one industry, moving that into the textile industry, and what you do actually is just, you're just putting one more step until you need to reach the landfill mm. uh, or in being incinerated. Because it is actually downgrading. The quality is not good enough, you cannot make it circular, it is just one more step towards landfill. Okay. So I think we could be proud Not in the beginning mm. that we can do that kind of technology. But right now, if you keep the bottles in the bottle circular loop, you can do that forever, mm. but do not bring it to textiles. Then mm. we need to have a different solution. Mm. And that's what you're working on. That's what we're doing. Nice. And, um, you know, all these great solutions, they really need to scale to have an impact in the greater perspective, right? Um, and that also comes with certain challenges. Um, I know this is something you have thought a lot about uh, with Syred, and it's like how to really kind of scale in a modular way. Could you maybe take us through yeah. how, you, how you think about that? So the, the entire company was set up to scale, so that's a very different approach. And here we can take learnings from other companies in the group. But basically, you need to have a financial structure in place, like investors, like, for example, then Norsken and TPG and a few more. So you need to have a financial structure in place. Uh, we actually did not invent, I'm not the inventor, we sourced the technology. So we found that one by selecting around 20 different technologies in the world, find it in North Carolina, two professors that have been working like close to 10 years, integrated with them. So that's our selection. And the selection is based also upon scale cost-efficient and with a good potential to scale. Mm. Uh, and then on top of that, then, <laughs> having H&M as one of the founders, uh, we also negotiated heavily last year with an off-take agreement for customer mm. contract. Uh, and that alone is just showing their commitment to this cause. So it's 50% of all the forecasted volume that H&M has for the next seven years. They put that into contract together with us. And that alone is worth $620 million. Mm. And if you have an asset like that, you have a team that is skilled at scaling, you have the technology that is cost-efficient and could scale, that's how you can build something that really makes an impact. Mm. So that's our approach. A bit different, daring, bold, and with very high ambitions. Cool. And Petri, you, you are right as we speak, as I've understood it, like really scaling up to commercial scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a big step. Could you maybe take us through a little bit kind of that journey from starting on lab scale and now like going all in? Right, so uh, neither I have been involved, let's say, throughout the whole story as the kind of first patents in, in our technology were filed already in 1982. So there was about 30 years both industrial as well as, as uh, kind of uh, scientific um, development road before I started. Mm. Uh, but definitely when, when I started 10 years ago, I figured out first that the industry really already at that, th at that stage had a, a true and honest interest on, on the new materials. They were mm. very active looking at that solutions and really kind of of uh, what has shaped our, our uh, road from, from that stage, lab scale to the kind of, of today's uh, planning and preparing for, for the industry scale manufacturing is, is a very strong cooperation together with the brands. So, and as, as I already mentioned earlier, that the, what was important for us is that, that we were kind of choosing the right partners. You could say we understood in the beginning that, that it would be nice to work with the uh, local Finnish brands like Marimekkos or, or such a companies, which are, are great companies as such, but don't have that much impact on, on the value chain. Mm. Whereas as when you choose maybe not the easiest partners, which are the Inditexes and Uniqlo's and HTMs of the world, but those are the companies who can really impact on the, on the value chain and the manufacturers. So right from the beginning, we understood that, that we just have to get on, on board those uh, giants mm. and, and to get the validation as well as getting their push so that the supply chain itself would be adopting the new materials. Mm. So as I say, that, that's been really vital. 
secondly, naturally, the step is, is also very different. Uh, just discussed uh, in the lounge with, with uh, Dennis that the, uh, say, today's business for us is, is kind of, of building the downstream supply chain, upstream supply chain. So one day you negotiate about uh, gigasize uh, uh, electricity agreements uh, with the suppliers who have never heard about you. Uh, it's kind of for becoming convincing those. Next day you, you negotiate with the large uh, chemical suppliers. So uh, say every day you, you meet new challenges and uh, new kind of, of things mm. what we have never done earlier. And always the question is that what is infinite fiber? What mm. do you do? <laughs> How are you going to pay for this? So, but I say it's been really fun uh, and, and, and nice, uh, challenging road uh, up to here, and also kind of for building the competencies around and, and taking the challenges as they come. Mm. Seems like one thing that I'm picking up from both of you is this like importance of building the relationships with the customers early to secure these offtake agreements, which I guess unlocks a lot of capital. And it sounds so easy when you say it like that, but like, how do you actually get to the offtake agreements? What's your, any tips and tricks for people in the audience who might be looking at similar? Yeah, journeys? so the, I think the, it was really kind of pivotal moment in, in our business as, as we were kind of, of uh, saying publicly in, in 2021 when we were 30, 40 people that we are going to build a industrial scale plant. Uh, and that kind of, of opened up a very different discussion, first of all, with the brands. As, as the, for the first time, our, our kind of concept solution was kind of becoming real for them so that they could be kind of, of taking the commercial use of it. Then uh, we were kind of, of uh, let's say, choosing from the available brands, the front runners. Mm. And the one we, we chose was first Patagonia, mm. as that's the kind of, of spearhead on the markets, being recognized as, as a kind of sustainability spearhead. Um, but equally also a kind of, uh, say, quality guarantor. Mm. And once we got uh, Patagonia on board, have negotiated the terms with them, and they were not that price picky either. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of really great, great uh, round to start working with others. So the, once you were able to get the first one on board, then we get, came to the equal terms with the others and said, hey, this is how they were buying. And at the same time, also kind of creating a fear to the other brands that, okay, if you are not adapting to the, or, or let's say, signing to the offtake now, it, there may be no offtake tomorrow available. So mm. it was kind of a uh, bit playing on, on, the, on the kind of chaos, mm. but, but kind of creating the sense of urgency to the customers. Mm. Mm. And then really the pivotal moment, the next one was, was when Inditex was willing to kind of uh, to make a, a stock uh, release, um, information release that they have signed a, a offtake agreement worth uh, more than 100 million euros which was kind of, of giving um, inspiration and, and uh, validation to the whole industry that, that there is existing such a concept where the brand is committing on long term to kind of, of take or pay type of agreement. Mm. Mm. And adding is, one more comment yeah, on that. Please. I think uh, as a scale-up company, uh, you, at least that's our approach, is that we put the risk on us. Mm. To say, here's the milestones, here's the quality deliveries, here are the risks when it comes to feedstock prices, etc. All that we put on our end, mm. enabling them, the brands, to take an easier step and say, ah, okay, so actually I'm committing to something that needs to meet the quality, meets, needs to meet the time. Mm. And what I do then as a brand is that I secure the capacity. Mm. And I think that's one way of looking upon it, mm. and uh, that has helped us a lot in the dialogue. Mm. Cool. Very good advice. Um, we talked a little bit about the kind of the past 10 years, but what, why do you think now is a good time to really kind of take the next step in terms of changing this dirty industry? Mm, I think the, the as, as discussed in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, that the, there has been happening a lot of, of changes. So the, in, the, in the beginning, what I was feeling still 10 years ago, that, that it was a kind of nice to have solution. Uh, the brands have, or the kind of fashion industry is not really technical. So they were fascina fascinated about even technologies, even they didn't understand that much about chemistry. But as such, it was fascinating for them to understand or, or let's even hear that how, how you're going to make that, uh, that, that change happening. Uh, but today, as I say, the regulatory push is, mm -hmm. is very clear. And uh, what is, has been good in it that, say, change 
on the regulation that, that brands, as a matter of fact, are wanting to have that. Mm. Because that's kind of, of uh, that's leveling the playground for everyone. It's not only about kind of strategic choice, but it is really becoming a, a strategic must-have. Mm. So, as I say, now the market is really, really ready for it. Mm. But at the same time, the brands have also figured out clearly that there's a lack of solutions. So they, they see that the, the regulation is pushing, the consumer demand is changing, mm. their own uh, targets are changing, but the number of solutions is still limited, mm. and, and those are not yet at that scale where it, it could be adopted by everyone. So I was going to say, that's been really creating a very, very nice push mm. on the markets to adopt new solutions. Yeah. What do you think, Dennis? I mean, uh, first of all, the planet needs it. Yeah. That is really the, the first. But I would also say that the brands are ready for it. Uh, I got into a realization when it comes to the bottle to fiber, seeing that they need to meet their science-based targets, and the, the solutions is not really there. So they need to commit to be part of this journey together. Mm. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. very good. Um, coming back to you again, Dennis. Uh, you, you're not only building a company, you're actually building a whole supply chain. Uh, which is, is quite complex and also has quite a lot of risk attached to it. Yeah. Could you maybe explain kind of the different pieces that you need to pull together for, sure. for this, the whole loop to be closed? Yeah. And also how you're mitigating potential risks across that loop? No, that's good and that's correct. And perhaps that was one of the surprises when we started. Uh, I was thinking that in ESG, we work mm. with the E yeah. primarily. But the more we work with this, we understand that the S, the societal impact, is just as big. Indeed. Because what we need is feedstock. We mm. need raw material that others would perceive as textile waste. Mm -hmm. So respecting the waste hierarchy at the very end, when no one is using it anymore, then we would like to take that. And that, is that, that chain is not really existing today. It may exist to some for cotton, because there is some value in that, but for, for polyester, it's really not. Mm. So we would need to build that ecosystem. And that is typically, you know, you have a couple of plants around the city, someone is collecting that, how do you do that in a safe way? Mm. Uh, very hot climate, typically. You would see bales of 500 kilograms of waste being piled up uh, and not really a safe environment. Mm. Uh, you have all kinds of situations here. So what we're doing now is that we are teaming up with, uh, you know, with those sorter and collectors. And we do that in each region. So we do it in Southeast Asia, in Europe and in Americas. Mm. So trying to keep it as local as possible, mm. but also aligning a roadmap. So in my mind, this is probably where the textile industry was like three decades ago, or maybe longer. Uh, but now this is for the feedstock, mm. sorting collectors. Mm. So then we are aligning a roadmap, say, all right, here's where we are right now, not a safe environment, working conditions, salaries, what have you. Mm. And then we line on that roadmap together and say, here's how we go from today's status to a decent or even better status. Mm. And that will require a lot of work together. Indeed, and a lot of collaboration with different a lot of stakeholders. On that. Is this something you also recognize, Petri, from, from your work? Yeah, so I say maybe building on, on what, what Dennis was saying, that it's not only kind of upstream supply chain, but the, it was very important is to building the downstream supply chain, because there's a quite a long journey from, from the fiber to the fashion, because fashion mm. is retail, and, and the kind of, of the value chain in between, which is yarn spinning, fabrics manufacturing, cutting, sewing, and, and making the ready-made uh, garments. That's the industry which is also kind of, of standalone industry, mm. and, and you need to be building the attraction also to those manufacturers so that that the they are not kind of feeling being lost or, or let's say losing some some new business is there, is there, business there. So you need to be spending a lot of, of time and energy on 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 kind of, of developing the fabrics, the textiles, together with those manufacturers, building the business case also that they are kind of still are earning well, good money on, on, on manufacturing, and then making the samples in, in large varieties available for designers, because at the end of the day, the, the, the say, brand is, is a, how, say it's, it's a business consisting of, of product design, supply chain, um, as well as retail. And if the designer doesn't have the samples in, 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 in his hand or her hands, mm. they will not going to make any, any, any kind of new collections on the market. So you've been, you need to be using a lot of time and efforts on, on building that value chain so that the chain, the chain to the industrial manufacturing happens. Mm. Mm. And the demand can take place. Exactly. exactly. Maybe adding one more yep. perspective, and that is the investor perspective. Mm -hmm. 
So, so the way we approach that is, of course, now as a company, we have a big reputational risks yeah. in the way that we collect and sort feedstock and how we operate across the value chain. The way we approach that is very clearly transparent. Mm. Transparency is key here. I think that's really what we are trying to, to work with. Mm. Uh, sharing openly, publicly, this is what we do, that, this is the status right now, and here's how we intend to go to a better stage. Mm. Yeah. And transparency is also very important as the as I say, one of, of the pitfalls uh, what the industry has today is that the, when you speak about sustainability, unfortunately, quite often it's, it's felt by consumers being greenwashing. Yeah, exactly. Because there has been so many sustainability messages which are not even true. Mm. So really kind of, of building a, a transparent supply chain where the kind of impacts are true. Mm. And um, also in that respect, the regulation is, is helping us as there's kind of digital passports which are under planning so that it would be really making the information and data transparent to the mm. consumers. Mm. Building a little bit on that, because um, the way we see it is that sustainability is really shifting from a mega trend to mega demand. And it's interesting to see impact companies like yourself uh, being built and grow. And what do you think about in terms of building your companies to not only build a competitive solution to the traditional players out there, but to really build something that can outperform the incumbents in this industry? Like, what are some of the advantages you see of maybe being an impact company? Hmm. I'd say, at least for, for us, what I just meant, that, that you really start from, from the customers, uh, yeah. from the brands, uh, so that, that your uh, targets are fully aligned with the, with the brands, so that, that, for example, in the beginning when we started, we had a full selection of different feedstocks, uh, starting from the wood-based pulp up to the textile waste or cardboard waste, and we had a, a very thorough discussion with the brands that, that where they see the value. Mm. Uh, as such, the textile, textile waste is the most demanding feedstock, as, as you have a full spectrum of, of, of mixed, mixed fibers in there, and, and some of it is also dirty. But as, as it was so clear a message from, from brands that that's what they desire, that, mm. that's where they see the highest value, and that's why we chose that, that mm. very, very demanding, uh, demanding road to go, mm. go ahead. So I must say, it, it all really starts from, from listening and planning your, your business case together with the, with the brands, mm. and then still being also daring uh, to set up, up, up your own pricing policy. Mm. Because say, it would be foolish to say that the fashion would be kind of, of a high, high pricing industry. So this, the message what we are hearing every day that it, it has to be comparable pricing yeah. or, or parity pricing. We just, let's say, created the value so high that, that in off-take agreements we were able to see that there was a, a willingness to pay mm. when you just, ha just have a supply which can, can meet the values what, what they are willing to sell. Mm. And Dennis, what, what are you seeing in terms of building Syria um, yeah. and, and competitive edge? Yeah. Maybe also in terms of like how you attract talent uh, yeah. and other aspects where you think you can really have an edge. Yeah. Uh, let me first start with uh, our view is that cost is fun. Uh, so we need to work intensively, very immense, to really focus on the cost. Because mm -hmm. the moment where we can actually achieve a lower cost than yeah. the virgin oil polyester, then there is really no excuse anymore. Exactly. So that is our long-term or medium-term goal, mm. to really be on that, that level. When it comes to attracting talent, this is interesting. Take, take the feedstock, the ecosystem approach that I mentioned before. Uh, how do you find a person that is capable of building, or a person or team, that is capable of building something that does not really exist? Mm. And in our view, we, we find one person that has been working, uh, uh, his name is Tim, he's been working with the film production, so he's been uh, handling really tough negotiations with the Hollywood uh, actors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he has been working five years in Tanzania uh, with the coffee production, optimizing, and previously also a McKinsey consultant. That was the kind of talent that we thought, that's excellent, we'll, we'll bring that in. Uh, and we have similar skill set on, on other teams. So we're not mm. only searching in the existing industry, mm. we're really searching outside of that, trying to mix that with the textile experience uh, from like Harsha, 25 years in H&M that we also have on board. Mm. Similar talent like that. Mm. Trying to create this mix. But it is challenging because many have been working in big companies and then join into a small company like a year ago, we were five persons. Now we're close to 40. Mm. Uh, it's still a small company. And how do you really balance that with you know, having the strategic outlook with the hands-on operations, yeah. run it like that? 
Thanks but it doesn't fit it. everyone. And have you, have you seen at all that you, know, you have easier to attract uh, top talent due to your mission about changing the world, basically? I mean, the, the passion, is, uh, it's so clear. Yeah. Uh, so we, had, we, have now, we are interviewing now an HR uh, person that will lead HR. She's coming from uh, oil and gas mm. uh, and she's living in Singapore. That's the person that we uh, now are considering to bring on board. And her, her motivation, her entire motivation is that she has been hurting the planet for quite many years now, supporting the oil and gas. She really would like to spend a number of years now to really bring sustainability to the mm. A game. And that's cool. so strong with uh, everyone that we are hiring. Very nice. Yeah, so as such, that's the fashion or clothing is, is, uh, is really tangible. Yeah. So it, it's easy to understand. Um, it's easy to see the impact, so of, of course it's been, or it's been easy to, to attract talent. Having actually said that, uh, there's, there's, as I say, we figured out that people between 30 and 45 are challenging, mm -hmm. as you have children and you have mortgage, so that's, that's when you prioritize the, the safe incomes. Mm. Whereas as, uh, the old farts like myself, uh, it doesn't matter that much, uh, easy to attract as well as youngsters. Um, but the, the, and then, I think, let's say, the more and more we see that even kind of, of getting partnerships with industrial companies mm. or engineering companies are, are, are relatively easy to get, as they really like the impact. Mm. The people want to be doing nowadays something where you really can have some, some impact on mm. the world itself. I think that's also something you have seen, Dennis, right, in terms of building yeah. these allies in the industry. Maybe you can share a little bit also yeah. in terms of companies or industrials that you're also working with. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, we are we're teaming up, that is our, uh, you know, you need to collaborate, you need to make it an industry movement here, clearly. Mm. So one example is that we, uh, two weeks ago, released a cooperation with Silenis, uh, a Portuguese company that we found, that is really good at specialty polymers, because uh, I haven't mentioned that, but we bring it all the way down to the monomer, up to the polymer, and then the same quality. Mm. So then we're teaming up with them, and they have the same ambitions to be really strong in sustainability. Mm. Uh, so we're kind of searching for those partnerships across the board. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that's also the, uh, the cap table that we have, really covering the world and different aspects of it. So I yeah. think that's really important. So in it together. Um, yes. One thing that uh, I guess all the founders in the, this room is uh, probably thinking about daily is like how to balance fundraising efforts versus building a business. Yeah. And especially in this challenging climate that we're seeing right now. Um, do you have any advice on that, like how to, how to think about that? Maybe you want to start, Dennis. Uh, it, is, it is part of the game, so yeah. <laughs> it is unavoidable. But of course, you go up and down in intensity. Yeah. The way we, we did, we passed in March a Series A of $100 million, uh, which means that we have a runway up at least until year end next year. Uh, so in the meantime then, uh, we are then interacting with potential lead investors for the next round. Mm. And also secure that the ones that we brought on board for the first round is capable of following through. Mm. So that's a way of, of minimizing the, the effort, but still, you know, keeping it engaged. Mm. So I think it comes in waves. It's yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. Maybe last question, because we are actually starting to run out of time. Um, I'm, again, I'm sure there's so many uh, founders here in the audience. What would be your advice to these founders when it comes to like, taking on to tackle like, one of these big industrial challenges, actually making a change in this world? Like, what, what would you be your advice, Petri? Right, that's what I say. First, uh, start with, with the customers. Start from the market. So one, once you really have the proof of, of the market traction, then you, you get also the investors, because the investors are following you when you have the customers. Aim high. Um, so right from the beginning, we understood that, say, the uh, perception of, of recycling means typically that, that it's low value, it's, it's low quality. Uh, whereas, as we were kind of, of taking the message the other way around, target on premium quality, so that nobody does mean to me need to be making any compromises in the industry, not the consumer, not the industry, so that that's where you are building your values. Mm. So as I say, start with cons cons customers, understand the market, and aim high on your aspirations. And build a team and, and be prepared to change the team as, as, as the time evolves. You need, have, need to have very, very different capabilities and expertise on the company compared yes. to what you need in the beginning. Mm. And last, uh, 
choose the attitude rather than, than, than skills. Skills you are not always trained, but that attitude you can't change. Nice. Dennis, what would you I, like to add? I mean, well said. So uh, I can just say that speed and scale makes an impact. So I think that's where you, uh, where you need to focus on. Mm. And then bringing the team in, as I say. That the uh, team is to make it happen. And that includes the board and the cap table and the ecosystem around. Mm. Cool. Ambition, scale, team, speed. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.